Good morning. I made it. Morning. I guess we can wait another minute. It looks like we're still missing quite a few people. Jason? Yes. Morning. Hey. Hey, Joe. There's Brian. All right, well, that looks pretty good. Uh, I guess I'll call this meeting to order of the Retirement Commission. And uh, we have a full agenda today, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, the first item on the agenda is yes, the... Yes, yes. Oops, sorry, guys. Hey. Hey, my microphone works. It does, you're right. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the January minutes from our last meeting. So is there a motion to approve the minutes or uh, are there any changes? I would move to approve the minutes from uh, December. January? January, January, sorry. Ben, was that you? Second it was. Okay. Yes. All right. All in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. All right, great. And uh, Brian, I'm going to shoot you an email. Um, there was a motion to make a recommendation in regards to the, the COLA for to send to council. So I'll make sure you get that now that it's been approved in the minutes from last month. Um, Okay, so if you remember last month, we started talking about the city's defined contribution plan and 457 plan, and there were a lot of questions. And so we promised that we would come back this month with more information for you. And we definitely have more information for you. So we've got um, some of our uh, vendors that we work with um, in regards to the defined contribution plan and um, the presentations, uh, just, describing the plan, describing their roles, um, how it fits in with uh, the city's overall strategy for retirement and benefits. And um, so we're gonna do that. And then after that, uh, Cap Trust is gonna be um, also giving us a presentation on what it means to be a fiduciary, um, especially in regards to the defined contribution plan, but some of those um, concepts and principles apply you know, generally into your role on the commission. And so, it's a training that we do periodically and thought that this might be a good time to do it as well since there's so many uh, people who have not gone through that fiduciary training. So with that, I will turn it over to Lisa and Sarah and um, they will kind of give an overview of uh, the, the plans from the city perspective and then they will introduce the, the next speaker from Mission Square as well. So Lisa, Sarah. Um, Lisa, you may be on mute. All right. 
We can't hear you, Lisa. There you go. Hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, but thank you all and I'll um, pick up. Thanks, Jason. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so you can see our presentation. Sorry about seeing all these different things. Oops, not that one. Hmm. Is it the one? Lisa, while, while you're searching there, um, if you are going to present something that you sent us as a PDF, could you also tell us what that file name is in, in case we want to pull it up on another screen here? Sure. It's the staff, um, DC staff plan presentation. Thank you. Sorry, I'm technologically impaired here. <laughs> ah! Can you guys see that? No. Oh. No. <clears throat> oh, now it's, it's loading. Yep. Okay. Just give it a second. Okay, I'm going to just jump right in. Lisa, is it this one? Yes. Can you see it? No. Not yet. Well, I'm going to start and hopefully it'll load. Um, so we know that you're all really familiar with the city's defined benefit plan and that plan provides a pension for the participants at retirement. But what we're going to talk about today is a different kind of plan called a defined contribution 401a plan. So we have two 401a plans and also a 457b plan, which I'll talk about a little later. So the four, just to talk about what basically what a 401a plan is, is it's a plan in which fixed contributions are paid into the participants' accounts and each participant has their own individual account. So the employer contributions go in and they're invested and then those contributions have earnings, positive or negative. And then upon retirement, this person has an account balance and that's what they use to fund their retirement. So two kind of important things is that in a defined benefit plan, we know the result because we have a formula that's used to calculate their pension. And then in a defined contribution plan, we don't know the result because the contributions are controlled by the participants, but we do know what's going in. So we know what the contributions are gonna be, but what's gonna, what their account balance is gonna be at the end, we don't know. So in the defined benefit plan, as you know, the retirement commission controls the investments and in the defined contribution plan, the participant controls the investments. Make sense? Does the, it says here just employer contributions, but are there not also employee contributions? Um, that's a really good question. And in this plan, there are no employee contributions. So you might be familiar with a 401k plan yeah. and in a 401k plan, participants can make contributions. But in a 401a plan, it's only employer contributions. So this is not a match or anything like that. This is a contribution they're gonna get no matter what if they choose this plan, okay? okay. Um, so let's talk about our particular 401a plan. So the first one we have is for general employees and it was established in July of 2001. Um, it was not established because we were trying to replace the defined benefit plan at all. We were just giving another option for participants. And as you guys are for employees, so as you might know, not everybody stays in a job for 25 or 30 years. So there has been a trend in the industry for um, employers to offer a defined contribution plan. And that way, if a person comes and works for a company or a city for just a few years and leaves, they're not leaving completely empty handed. So they don't have to start retirement savings again from scratch. Um, so the employer contribution in this plan is 8% of pay and it's deposited into the employee accounts every payday, which is biweekly. And like we just said, there are no employee contributions to it. Um, this plan has a three-year graded vesting schedule. So vesting is basically how the employee earns ownership of the money in the account. 
So after one year in this plan, they're 33% vested. After two years of employment, they're 67% vested. And then after three years, they are 100% vested. So what that means is say somebody left and they only worked here for four years, then they would have ownership of everything in that account. And if their balance is more than $1,000, they can leave it in the plan or they could um, take it out in a lump sum, not that we recommend that, or they could roll it over into a new plan if they had one at their new job, or they could roll it over into an IRA. Um, so this plan has a wide variety of investment options that participants can choose from. Um, we do have some that never make a choice. So those people, their contributions default into a target date fund based on their date of birth. And then something else to note is that participants who retire with at least 10 years of service may be able to continue their medical and their dental coverage at their own expense. So that's a post-retirement benefit. Any questions so far? You said you want me to try to pull the slides up? Oh, is it not? You can't see it still? I printed it out, so I'm looking at it, but. <laughs> I'm no, sorry. we cannot. Okay. Ms. Um, Birch, could I ask a question? Yes. Um, good morning, all. The So what happens with the basic general retirement plan with the city if an employee leaves? So they've worked for the city for 10 years and then take a new job. What happens to their their savings, their so retirement talking, at that point. You're talking about someone who's in the defined benefit plan and leaves after 10 years? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the defined benefit plan has a five-year vesting schedule. And so if an employee is hired right now, then to participate in the defined benefit plan, they have to put in 5% of their pay. And then the city also contributes regularly. So, uh -huh. um, and we keep track of their own contributions and then their own contributions also earn interest once a year. So if they leave before five years is up, then they're not vested, but they do get a refund of their own contributions plus the interest. If they leave okay. say, after five years, like 10 years, like you just said, then they're vested, but if they're not retirement age, then they still will have a benefit in our plan and they can go off, they can't take it with them, like they can't roll it anywhere, but they can um, count on having a benefit at retirement age. So we calculate what their vested benefit is, and then they get back in touch with us when they're 64. Usually like if they're public safety, then they their normal retirement age is 60. But basically then we start paying their pension at, at retirement age. Okay, all right, so okay. with the DC defined contribution, there's more flexibility, I guess when they, if a person- If a leaves, person leaves, leaves, yes. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. So let's get back to how you guys can see the slides, because I'm not sure- If you like stop I, sharing, Jason will try and share. I think that probably- Okay, be that would be yeah. wonderful. Okay, I'm stopping the share. Thanks, Barry. Jason, are you gonna try to share? Ah, perfect. You shouldn't feel bad, Lisa. I wouldn't even have the courage to start. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. This is not my forte. <laughs> is that what okay, I think if you go down one more slide. Um, so the what the plan I just talked about was the uh, 401A plan for general employees, and we also have one for lead team employees. So in that plan, the contribution amount is set by the city manager, and instead of having a three-year um, vesting schedule, this is 100% immediate vesting. Um, and the participants in the lead team plan have the same investment options as the general plan and also the same default investments as the general plan. What's a lead team? Lead team is like city manager and um, deputy city managers, directors. Sarah, am I yeah. making that um, The department heads, basically, directors. Okay. So can I ask a question? The city manager sets the contribution rate. Is he in that plan? Yes. Yeah. No? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Any questions? What is the contribution rate? 
Uh, the contribution rate right now is 19.5%. Sarah, did I hear that right? You said the contribution rate is 19.5%. Yeah. yeah, that's what this is Lisa and that is correct. That's what I oh, said. Sorry, Lisa. Yeah, okay. that's okay. Any other questions? Lisa, is there a comparable um, contribution rate uh, per employee in the defined benefit that you could state? So you guys know that we have an actuary who comes and determines what we're going to contribute every year. So Jason, do you want to I'm not exactly sure what that. Uh, yeah, I've got the rates here. Um, general employee, the combined rate for pension and OPEB is 23.96. And the public safety contribution rate is 43.8. Thanks, Jason. And that covers the current benefit plus the amortized liability. Okay, so if you want to um, move forward one slide, Jason, just going to give a really quick overview of the plan administration, how it all works together. So we have a, a record keeper um, and it's Mission Square and otherwise known as ICMARC. And in a couple minutes, we're going to have Steve, who's going to give a presentation on what they do. Um, then we have an investment advisor and the company is CapTrust and we do have Barry and Fran from CapTrust who are going to do a presentation today as well. Um, there's informal subcommittee oversight and the day-to-day -day administration is done by the human resources staff. So that's pretty much me and Sarah. And by day-to-day, -day, I'm talking things like um, enrolling new employees, um, submitting the contributions every pay period, um, terminating people when they leave employment, stuff like that, okay? Also providing information on request when they when anyone asks. Um, so can we go one more slide? So kind of to give you a little bit of an idea of how that all works is that we have, say we have a new person who's hired, then they have 30 days to choose between the defined benefit plan and the defined contribution plan. So that choice, once they make it, is irrevocable. So we don't allow someone to start. Maybe they think, oh, this is a temporary job. I'm not, I'm not going to work here for very, I'm only going to work here a couple of years. So I'm going to pick the defined contribution plan. But then they realize this is a great place to work and they're going to stay forever. Then they can't decide to switch to the defined benefit plan at that point. They have to choose in that first 30 days. Um, so we give every new employee who's eligible for retirement information during onboarding so that they can make a choice. Um, and we've tried to give them information in a couple of different ways because people learn things differently. So we have a video which we um, um, have people watch. Um, we also have um, a flip book, which is like a virtual book basically that gives details on both plans and has a side by side so that they can compare them apples to apples pretty much. Um, we also, well, pre-COVID restrictions, we did group orientations face-to-face, -face, but that has not been allowed since I've been here, since COVID restrictions went into place. So we do phone and face-to-face one-on-one consultations on request. Um, also, we have a wonderful Mission Square representative who is available and we give her name and number and email address out to everyone. and. In addition to meeting and talking to people, when they reach out to her, she also has one day a month where it's dedicated to us. And so I send out an e-blast and people can make appointments with her. Lisa? Yes. With all of what I'm looking at here, all of the things that you do, uh -huh. how well do you think people actually understand? I think that... There are some people who don't understand. So we are looking forward to when we can have the group, um, the group orientation again. But I actually feel like I get a lot of questions and I do feel like 
sometimes people might go to their own department heads and say, what do you like, can you just explain the, the difference? What I would like is if they all came to HR so that we can make sure they're getting all the right information. But I have seen where certain departments might be more likely to choose one of the plans over the other. Ooh, and uh, also, I would also say that a lot of people come, especially younger people come and work for the city and they feel like they understand a 401A plan and how it works better than a defined benefit plan. Hmm. So I ran a, you know, a fair size company for a number of years. And one of the things that fell to me was the retirement plan. Uh -huh. um, so it's not like the city, there wasn't a pension. Um, it was a 401k plan. Um, and I found regardless of how much information was provided, um, that at the end of the day, a lot of people really just didn't get it. And, you know, I could see what was going on if I wanted to look, which most of the time I didn't, but sometimes I did. Um, and people did dumb stuff. Um, you know, I mean, if there's a list of do's and don'ts, they landed on the don'ts a lot. Um, so, and it concerned me because, I mean, basically they were losing money <laughs> that, that they didn't need to be losing, um, I think, because they, finance can be confusing. Um, so that's why I'm asking the question. Um, so when you say they lost money, do you mean that they made bad investment choices? Well, either they didn't understand the investment choices and, you know, a 20 year old settling for a bond fund is stupid. Um, people did it. Um, okay. So or, I do. Oh, sorry. Uh, a, market, a market like today's, like this month's um, or in 2008, I'll give you an example. Um, one of the investments available was a science and technology fund. I think it was a T. Rowe Price fund. So, I mean, it was a good fund, but it had a very high risk reward um, going on there. So, when the Great Recession occurred and the market tanked, I mean, literally fell apart, I watched a guy who was over 60 liquidate hundreds of thousands of dollars at a huge loss in that fund. And then six months later in a meeting, I can remember the question. He asked, when do you think I should get back in? And by that time, the market had gone up about 90%. And I said, six months ago is when you should have gotten back in. Um, so David, let me ask, did you have a representative from your record keeper who talked to people? Um, yeah, me. Oh, so we have Antoinette and she's very accessible. So I think the people who have questions do reach out to her. Like she has relationships with some of our people, but also, and I'm not sure, I'm not going to speak to what your, your options were in that plan you were just referencing. But we do have people who are just not interested in investing or not interested in learning about it. And those are the people who usually default into the target date funds. So maybe it isn't the best choice for them, but I don't know what more we could do to make sure they're making good choices in their investments besides offering a wide variety of good choices and then also having that default. But you know what, I'm gonna defer to Barry when it's his turn to talk because he yep. is the investment yep. expert and he's the one who can probably better answer that question than me, okay? okay? But I will just say on this slide is that what we're trying to get across is that we do um, educate people on what the choice is before they make that choice and also we do have an HR in touch portal for employees. So they do have access to information later as well. It's not like they just have it one time when they first start. Okay. 
Um, so then if we could go to the next slide. Um, so as we mentioned a couple of times, the 401A plans don't allow employee contributions, but we do have employees who want to save more for retirement. So we also offer another plan called the 457B plan. So this plan is um, nice because employees can enroll at any time. They don't have to do it in that first 30 days. Um, they can contribute what they want. So they can put in a dollar amount every pay period. They can put in a percent every pay period. They can um, increase or decrease their contributions at any time. So say they're putting in $100 a pay period, but then something happens and they have a little financial crisis, they can stop it and restart it later. Um, we allow pre-tax and Roth contributions. Um, the record keeper is Mission Square as the same as the 401A. The investment advisors cap trust, just like the 401A, same oversight and day-to-day -day administration is also human resources. Any questions about the 457B? Okay, so basically the, just the last thing I will say is that there is a lot more information. So I could have spent the whole entire meeting talking about these plans. We didn't want to overwhelm you, but um, if you're interested in more information, I'm happy to, um, there's this link right here, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And if it's not in this meeting today, you can reach out to me anytime, or we can go into a deeper dive at a future meeting if you guys need to. Okay. And with that, any other questions anyone has? Because if not, then I'm going to pass the baton to Steve Shorman from Mission Square. Um, he is a regional manager and he's been with us for a long time and he has a presentation to share on their role as the record keeper. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, uh, Jason, for the introduction earlier and pleasure to be here with all of you this morning. So as Lisa mentioned, I work for Mission Square Retirement. We are the record keeper for your 401 as well as 457 plans. And I do have just kind of some, a little bit of information to share with you in terms of the history of the company, kind of our structure, how we operate, what we do. And then also to kind of address what I just heard some of the questions were in terms of how we actually educate your participants as well. Um, Lisa referenced uh, Antoinette, who is a member of my team who works with uh, Charlottesville participants. And so we'll be able to kind of speak to what her role is and what exactly she does. So can everyone see the slideshow that just popped up? Perfect. You're much better at sharing than I am, Steve. <laughs> Been doing this for a while. Uh, so as Lisa mentioned, you know, we are Mission Square Retirement. You might have previously heard from us as a different name, as ICMARC. We went through a rebranding oh, about a year and a half ago, and we're still kind of transitioning to the new name. You know, we're still legally ICMARC. We still have the same mission-driven focus in what we did. And that we are a nonprofit organization that exists solely to help and to benefit public sector employees. So we've been in existence for 50 years. 2022 is actually our 50th anniversary as a company. And you know, so basically all we've been doing since we were created in 1972 by a Ford Foundation grant is literally working with public sector, you know, employees, workers, you know, city managers at all levels to really help them to, to grow towards retirement and make sure they have a good plan as they approach and work through their career. So as we mentioned, we have a volunteer board of directors made up of public and private leaders. You know, our current chairman of the chair of the board is actually the city manager of Gaithersburg, Virginia, a woman named Tanisha Briley. So she's our current chair of the board. She comes with a wealth of knowledge and experience. So it's a complete independent board of oversight as well as our executive leadership team. And again, we really try to maintain that focus on being this nonprofit, non-stock organization solely devoted to public sector. And most recently, as you see in the last bullet point, we have branched out into education and healthcare markets as well. So we're now offering products for, for teachers in some states, as well as working with hospitals and other uh, medical facilities. So a little bit about us and kind of where we stand as an organization today. As I mentioned, founded in 1972, we currently administer over 9,800 public sector plans with an individual participant accounts of over 1.6 million. As of the end of the month last month, we have over $73 billion in total assets under management and just within Virginia, over 8 billion of that. And we do also administer the Virginia Retirement System or VRS, 
which Charlottesville has their own system, but everyone is familiar with BRS and kind of the, the organization and what they represent and what they do. And so it's really nice because, you know, my team and the VRS team, they work very closely together. We're very familiar with all of those plans. So we can really help people across the state as they work through um, their career and any transitions they might have. And one thing that's really unique to Charlottesville that we're very proud of, which I know Lisa and Sarah and Barry and Fran have heard a hundred times at this point, is in 1972 when Mission Square, ICMARC got founded, our very first client was the city of Charlottesville. And so you guys have been with us from the beginning. We're extremely proud to still maintain that relationship and work very closely with you. So some of the things that we do and how we can really help you as a plan sponsor and well as participants is we open you know, all sorts of investment options. We have our own proprietary funds. And then you also have your custom fund lineup, which is designed by CapTrust. One of the advantages of that is it really allows a full breadth, uh, breadth of options for your participants. We do have you know, good plan administration support. We have a relationship manager for the plan, which is myself. And I work very closely with Lisa, Sarah, and uh, Barry and Fran on plan options and design and all the things that are needed to make the plan run smoothly. And then one of the things I did hear a lot of questions about, especially uh, that David was asking, is what the participant experience looks like and you know, how we can really help people to make proper decisions. And Lisa did mention Antoinette, who is your on-site representative. And so some of the things that she does is, again, she can have these in-person meetings over the phone or virtually, you know, with people to help guide them through. And we do have a lot of different tools and calculators I'll briefly show you on the back half of the presentation here as well. Just some of the things that we provide as plan support for plan sponsors when they administer or when we administer your plan. As you can see, we have all these different options that are available uh, for plans to adopt at zero charge for the plan. A nice tool that we also incorporate, which allows us both internally as well as working externally with the city to really help kind of assess and monitor what's happening within the plan is a tool that we call Plan Health Monitor. And basically what this does is it aggregates all of the participant level data that's coming in on a, a daily basis, essentially, as participants make decisions and as they you know, invest and move through their career. And it kind of rolls it all up to a, a global plan snapshot where it allows during our regular meetings with the city as well as CapTrust, to really look at what's happening, you know, kind of under the hood of the plan, identify trends, behaviors, see exactly what investment decisions participants are making. And then we can really use that for me and my team to tailor how we work with participants to educate them, you know, the messaging that we're delivering, and, you know, really kind of refine and, and adapt each time that we look at this to go forward to make sure that we're delivering the best and most accurate information and education for participants. And so just a brief snapshot of the current data, and this is as of, I believe, the end of December. So in terms of active participants within the plan, in the 401A, you have 305, and in the 457B, 382. You do see some pretty healthy average account balances there. And again, this represents people at all stages in their career. And the total assets within the plans you do see uh, right there as well. And this does not include the secondary 401A, which is the smaller plan. So it's just the main one, and then your, your main 457B. So in terms of, again, what we do and how we actually work with participants to help them make appropriate decisions is we do have that local representative, Antoinette, available both in person as well as digitally. She does online seminars, webinars, one-on-one -on -one consultations. Participants have access to their accounts online all the time through account access where they can make investment choices, decisions. They can change their investments, you know, really kind of tailor it to exactly what they want to do. We do have a really great mobile app, which essentially has all of that same functionality because we do recognize public sector. You know, a lot of people don't sit in front of a computer all day. So if they're out in the field or you know, wherever it is, they still have access to their account and can still listen to pre-recorded videos, webinars, seminars, any of that kind of stuff. We recently also rolled out what we call the Financial Wellness Center, which is again, is a great educational tool for participants to kind of get a good holistic view of their finances. So it incorporates a lot of tools where they can enter in, you know, any outside accounts they might have through a tool called account aggregation. They can set personalized goals if they're saving for certain things like that. And basically this tool really learns and adjusts with them as they progress through it to help them on their individual, you know, path towards their goals or to retirement as well. 
One of the newer things we're also doing this year is we're rolling out some new targeted monthly communications. You can see a brief calendar here, just some of the themes that we'll be sharing, what the messaging is. And this is gonna be coming from not only our marketing department, but also you know, messaging that Antoinette will be sending out as well. The, the webinars and the seminars are all in a really kind of tailored around thematic units that really help to drive certain action items for participants. You know, For instance, February is take care of your loved ones. So as a push to make sure that beneficiaries are updated because we see so many times when those things aren't updated and the results of it. And then next month, you know, it takes more than luck to invest wisely. Again, just making sure that people are making appropriate investment decisions depending on where they're at in their career. And again, some of the other things we're doing here, again, just to help people and make sure that they are aware of all the tools and resources we have is again, we have some campaigns that we do. Additionally, now personalized stuff for participant onboarding, uh, milestone age checkups, you know, very personalized sorts of things as they approach retirement. Then all sorts of different tools, again, just to basically encourage people to stay engaged with their account, as well as stay engaged with, with Antoinette with any questions they might have. And, you know, for instance, David, you mentioned people often make poor investment decisions. And that is something that we see a lot, obviously. And we saw it in 2020 when the market went down and and everyone tried to flee to safety. And I know that people on my team were getting bombarded with phone calls of people saying, you know, cash out, cash out, put me in the plus fund. And, you know, it really is unfortunate. One of those things that a lot of people do have that reaction, but also one of the great things that from speaking with my team and speaking with Antoinette is a lot of times she's able to really talk people back from making those poor decisions or making incorrect decisions and say, Hey, you know, it's okay. We just have to ride it out, you know, see what happens. You're 20 years from retiring. There's no need to, to be selling all, everything out right now. So a lot of times that kind of personal touch and that personal connection that we've built with your participants is really what does help to, you know, kind of save them as they, you know, from potentially doing something catastrophic, like in that example you mentioned. So I know I just went through a lot very briefly and very quickly here. So I did just want to then pause here and see if anyone had any questions or anything that you would like me to go into more detail on. I like this. Thank you. Were there any other, any other questions about just Mission Square, what we do, kind of how we work with your participants or anything like that? All right. Well, with that, I will stop sharing that and turn it back over to you, Lisa. And again, thank you all for your time and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this morning. I did have one question. I'm sorry, it took me a second to get to my uh, sure. mute. Um, you mentioned, is it coordination with VRS or yeah, what so relationship? As, so we're the record keeper for VRS. Oh, so really? We okay. are, yes. So all of VRS? That, for all of VRS, yes, sir. For the entire state okay. of Virginia. That's so, very impressive. So essentially what that really allows us to do is, you know, the people on my team are very, very familiar with, with VRS because, you know, uh -huh. we deal with so many people, especially in other cities that are, you know, plan one, plan two or hybrid employees. And they have uh -huh. those questions as well. And being kind of, you know, the record keeper for it, we, you know, we know VRS very well, obviously. So it really does allow the people on my team, you know, throughout Virginia, to kind of really explain, you know, hey, here's how your hybrid plan works. Here's how it matches or dovetails with a 457 that's being offered by your employer or whatever it is. So yeah, I mean, it really is kind of that, that, that partnership that we share with them. And they have their own education team. So it's not the same people on my team, but you know, we do share a lot of information. We all meet regularly to make sure that we all kind of have the, the correct knowledge and we're doing the same things. Okay, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so next we are gonna have a presentation by Barry Schmidt and Fran um, Slickham. Sorry if I mispronounced your name, Fran. No, you're fine, you're fine. Anyway, um, and they are our financial advisors from Cap Trust. So take it away, Barry. I think Fran is gonna share our screen. Well, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity this morning. My name is Barry Schmidt. I've been honored to, to work with the city of Charlottesville for over a decade now. Uh, I didn't have as much gray hair then, but that has nothing to do with, uh, with the city of Charlottesville. It's, it's raising kids for sure. Um, so we're, we're, there's two things we're gonna talk about today. The first is we're just gonna give you a brief uh, background of our role with the city of Charlottesville. And then we're gonna go right into fiduciary training. We do think 
you know, while you are a non-ERISA plan, we, we use ERISA as a guide in the decision-making process. So we think it's a good reminder for the commission <clears throat> when you make decisions, making decisions solely in the best interest of plan participants. And we'll talk about uh, those, those items as well. <clears throat> at the same time, excuse me, at the same time, I do want to answer some questions regarding menu construction. So I, I want to make sure you understand, kind of get a complete picture of how we go about what we do. Uh, you know, somebody just asked a question, what is ERISA? ERISA is, uh, if you're a private sector employee, there is a, a Employee Retirement Income Securities Act, uh, the only thing I think Gerald Ford ever uh, created uh, in Labor Day 1974. And that really serves as the guide for you know, private employer 401k plans. David had mentioned 401k plan. That would be, that would be under the, uh, the ERISA regulations. You know, while you aren't ERISA, you do have fiduciary responsibility with respect to the, 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 the management of the funds, the, the oversight of the funds. So we're using that necessarily you know, as, a, as a best practice in terms of how you fulfill your duties. So if you think about uh, really three roles, uh, you have you know, the plan sponsor, you know, City of Charlottesville has made the decision to offer a defined uh, contribution plan. Uh, you know, there are certain functions that the city uh, maintains. Uh, at the same time, you just heard from Steve talking about the role of the record keeper. You know, we sit kind of on the side of that. Uh, we monitor. Uh, we monitor Mission Square from a from a fee from an accountability perspective. We also uh, work with the city in determining the funds that are in the plan. Uh, but we, you know. Most of your participants would not never know who Cap Trust was, though. Although we've been part of the 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 401A plan, the 401A lead team, and the 457 plan for again well over a decade now. There's a lot of words here, so I'm trying to like uh, pick out a couple uh, items. You know, we have been in business since like the late 1980s, and with really one simple premise. Good. Companies are better served by somebody independent from the process. So we are, when we come to the table, we are 100% objective. All the revenue as a firm we receive are based on client contracts. So we don't, we don't receive a dime <clears throat> from investment managers. We don't receive a dime from Mission Square, other record keepers. So again, when we come to the table, we are not conflicted in the recommendations that we have. We have a, we have a, um, a, a uh, item that that we subscribe to it's called the no golf ball rule and it's you think it's probably pretty hokey but we, we are the gatekeeper for a lot of assets uh and if mission square wants to engage with us in, in lunch we we would probably cover their lunch or we would go dutch at the, at the very least so we want to make sure that we don't have any sort of quid pro quo with respect to uh, the city of Charlottesville and the decisions we make as as a as an organization, yeah. If you look at our, our assets, we have a little over um, six hundred, almost seven hundred billion of assets under advisement across the country. We are a national firm. Uh, you know, we uh, we have been the advisor in the UVA relationship for uh, since two thousand two. The UVA Physicians Group in Charlottesville. So we have a number of uh, of uh, fairly large plans in VCU, uh, Virginia Tech, George Mason, et cetera, with respect to the state of Virginia and others, certainly. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the, thing, the things that we do as an organization, if you look at kind of the, the middle of the page, a little bit to the right, institutional retirement advisory services, we fill a couple functions. The first function is plan level investment advice. So we are about menu construction. When we think about participants, you know, they have the ability to invest in any number of areas. So, you know, David, uh, I, I appreciate the comments you made earlier about a science and technology fund. We don't have a science and technology fund in, in the menu for that very reason. You know, it's great, you know, it's great when our volatility is on the upside. It doesn't feel so good when volatility is on the downside. And so we, we've really tried to, create a fund menu that is sustainable, that protects uh, the participant. You know, we are going to have down markets. We're seeing down markets uh, within the last se several weeks for sure. But we, 
we want to make sure that they're protected on the downside as best as we can, although we don't, we're not immune to negative performance for sure. Uh, but that, yeah, so we, we spend a lot of time on the fund menu. We use the, the T-Row price target date funds. So if you think about the, the default, if somebody doesn't make an election, uh, we would put them into the target date fund that is most closest to their 65th birthday. And so over time, the goal is that fund becomes less aggressive over time. It's set it and forget it. And so we think that's really from a, from a long-term perspective, a very appropriate investment vehicle. The other thing that we do, I go ahead. A question, Lisa, last meeting, did we not see the makeup of, of the options, the choices? That, am I I, yeah, I did share a list of the investment options last time. Okay, that's what I thought. Yes. And we, we can put me on, we would, would you like to pull that up? Do you need it? I mean, I, I, can, I can certainly pull that up. Go ahead, Fran. Yeah, pull, let's see if you can pull that up. So yes, yeah, so if you're if you're a new City of Charlottesville employees employee, you have the ability to invest in these particular fund options. And so, if you'll notice, uh, we have uh, from low risk to high risk funds. Again, we want to make sure participants have enough choice so that they can make decisions based on their risk profile, their risk preferences. The default again, T Rowe Price Target Date funds, and you'll notice. We're from Lotus, we have a, a cash management fund, we have a fixed annuity as part of the equation, we have bond funds, and then we go all the way up to the most risky, which is a real estate fund. And so we, we have the ability for participants to make their own decisions, but we are, we're trying not to overwhelm them with too many choices. Thanks for pulling that up, Barry. And Fran? <laughs> but we do, we do uh, as an organization, <clears throat> we're firm believers in division of labor. So <clears throat> we have a separate research team that uh, when we're looking at, when we, when we are looking at a fund, let's say a fund fails policy guidelines for one reason or another, we have a group of people that that's what they live and breathe every day is to really to, to look at the marketplace go through various funnels to decide like what would be an appropriate replacement vehicle for that particular asset class, that particular fund. Uh, we would have vetted it already with Mission Square to make sure it's available on the platform. So we have a separate group that, that solely focuses on investment research and analysis. But you can see, I mean, I, I'm not gonna belabor the point here. You know, we have a lot of experience in defined contribution plans across the country. Uh, and you know, we've been honored uh, in the city to, to work with you all for, again, a little bit over a decade. When we do a quarterly review, there's, uh, there's a couple things that we do each committee meeting. <clears throat> we always want to make sure that as the committee, we're no more than 90 days out of things that are happening in the marketplace. So we, it's the topical spotlight or regulatory environment. So you know, what are things that are taking place with respect to the current legislation, with respect to any number of items uh, that might affect the future of the plans, and so we always, we always, uh, we always start with that. Then, of course, we talk about the market. You know, the market is by the time we meet, it's typically rearview mirror because it's really about what happened, not ne necessarily what's going to take place in the future. So we really tried and focus on what are some themes in the marketplace that we ought to be thinking about in terms of whether it's tailwinds of the market, things that are driving the market forward or headwinds, things that are uh, clearly uh, keeping the market from moving forward. Inflation is kind of one that we've been talking about at every committee meeting as of, as of late. But we try to provide enough information you know, periodically. You know, we have a lot of thought capital uh, and so we want to make sure that the city is informed of that various thought capital uh, in, in, uh, in various uh, emails, webinars, et cetera, that we would uh, engage uh, uh, your, uh, your committee on. 
these are these are really our we call them the five pillars of a su successful defined contribution plan and so if you think about any number of areas you know, we we feel very strongly we feel like an, an inch wide and a mile deep in these five areas so you know plan design we have other 401a plans and so what are the other 401a plans from a market perspective doing with respect to the match we talked about you know, the eight percent employer contribution participant engagement like how, how what are other organizations doing to better engage to better uh, equip participants to make more informed decisions to better educate em employees with regards to their options so we work in partnership with mission square making sure that we we have the best interest of the you as you as a plan participant in mind when they when they approach and engage participants yeah clearly investment management is at the cornerstone of what we do uh, you know, making sure we have the the a fund menu that's diverse enough where participants can make their own choices, but not not too uh, not too many choices where they're condemned by choice. So we think we have a really good balance of funds uh, in the plan. Also sustainable. We want to make sure that the funds that we have in the plan, if we do our jobs on the front end, we don't necessarily have to uh, continuously change funds for bad performance or or it's drifting of assets into a particular style that we didn't hire them for so any number of reasons we're not immune to having to make fund changes periodically but based on our process we really uh we've really not had to make many fun choices or fun ads or additions or deletions in the city of charlottesville plan over the last few years we're about fiduciary process go ahead david i noticed you had two or three marked for review. Yep. And I, I could, in fact, Fran, go back to that while, while David's uh, getting the, having the question, I'll, I'll respond to that question. So, you know, we, we have a certain methodology we, we, by which we evaluate funds. And, you know, funds are gonna make bets on occasion that may not pay off in the, in the short term. And so I'll use like uh, the T. Rowe Price Mid-Cap Growth Fund as an example. We have a certain rubric and it's, it's on a hundred point scale, as long as a, based on all the various measures, as long as the fund is scoring above an 80, it's in good standing. This particular fund is scoring a 76 or 78. Uh, and the reason you know, that is the case, T. Rowe Price Mid-Cap Growth Fund is, uh, is employed, uh, what's called a growth at a reasonable price mandate. So you think about 2020, uh, and you know, valuations were out the window. People couldn't buy enough Apple, it didn't matter what their valuations were. This particular manager, because it has a valuation discipline, didn't own those particular securities. So they really got hurt performance wise on the short term. However, fast forward that to 2021, 2022, this was one of the top performing funds in the marketplace. So we wanna make sure that the committee understands, you know, these are gonna ebb and flow some, uh, and we wanna make sure we respond to any, any funds that might be marked for review in our in our particular evaluation methodology it doesn't mean we should replace them it just means that the, hey you know we're we're looking at this fund a little closer that makes sense david yep but yeah then fiduciary process you know, one of the things that we do is we uh we draft all the committee meeting minutes so before before we got on to normal business, every committee meeting, the first order of business is to approve the minutes, just like you did today uh, on uh, the prior committee meeting minutes. And, and so it's really our way of making sure we document the process, because that's all your, if you were to follow ERISA, uh, you know, that documentation is really the key. And we think that's a really a best practice anyways. And then vendor management, you know, we, we deal with <clears throat> probably a hundred or so different record keepers like Mission Square. You know, Mission Square has a particular core competency in, in the 457 market. Uh, and, and so when we, you know, we are benchmarking your fees, so that's another uh, role that CapTrust serves. Uh, pro every probably 12 to 18 months, we benchmark the, the city of Charlottesville's fees relative to other similarly structured programs across the country to make sure that you continue to uh, have a reputable partner, which you do, but also making sure 
that uh, the fees are reasonable within the, within the marketplace. We recently did that with Mission Square. We ended up reducing your fee to 12 basis points on the plan. And so we will continue to do that in the future. That's a, I mean, this is, this is our team. Any questions before we completely switch gears and talk about fiduciary responsibility? So hopefully you get a good sense of kind of what role we serve. So we ready to switch gears? <clears throat> you know, one of the things that we, that we do periodically is just making sure committees are informed with their responsibilities. And you think about the city of Charlottesville today, even though you know, the defined benefit plan uh, <clears throat> is a little bit different animal, there's still some themes here. When you, when you go into that committee meeting, you're not going into the committee meeting as an employee like you need to be more aggressive here, you need to be less aggressive here. You're going in there and representing all of the employees of the city of Charlottesville. And, and so all the decisions that you're making are really, you're taking off the hat of any personal, uh, any personal biases and you're putting on the hat of the employees. And that's really what uh, ERISA as a best practice is designed to do. So if you think about, uh, if we were to follow ERISA again as a, as a best practice, uh, who, uh, who is a fiduciary? So if you think about who's a fiduciary, if you have discretionary authority over the management or administration of the plan or its assets, uh, exercises any control authority or influence over the management or administration of the plan or its assets, or renders investment advice for a fee, which we do, uh, you are deemed to be a fiduciary for the plan. And I, I would think that the commission would uh, accept that you are a fiduciary with respect to the decisions you make on the, on the pension plan. You, you might hear other terms, you, know, you, you might have a named fiduciary, the plan sponsor has certain fiduciary functions, uh, the trustee, you might have trustees of the plans, a plan committee clearly uh, can be a, a fiduciary, uh, the investment advisor again. You know, uh, parties interacting with participants, you think about Mission Square and you know, the role that they serve, you know, there could be situations where they would uh, take on a fiduciary responsibility with respect to the advice they provide individual participants. And then more board members more by, by oversight and um, as opposed to uh, as opposed to day-to-day -day operations, more delegation, uh, you know, for, of their responsibilities. You know, as a fiduciary, you want to make sure you understand your fiduciary obligation. That's what we're talking about today. Have the appropriate tools and resources to fulfill your duties. Like Cap Trust, I think you have an outside advisor that works with you on the pension plan. You know, same same basic premise, and make sure that you meet your responsibilities in a prudent and objective manner. And and we have never seen this to be any issues whatsoever with respect to the committees that we work with within the city of Charlottesville. Uh, every time we meet, we're really talking about all plan participants, not necessarily any particular bias that an individual, individual committee member might have. Yeah, we can skip that page. Yeah, there, there are really six duties that we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk on the first three and then Fran is going to a follow up with the last three. So it's duty to be prudent of loyalty and impartiality, duty to, of diversification, monitoring and supervising, ensure reasonable plan costs, as well as avoid prohibited transactions. These are all going to be common sense. There's not going to be anything here we talk about today that you're like, okay, that just makes, that makes sense to us. And, and uh, we don't feel this as, as being confrontational whatsoever. But your know, duty to be prudent, uh, you know, it's about it's about the uh, whether or not prudent investment practices were followed. Uh, you know, you do have you're held to a higher standard because you are you sit on a committee. You have the ability to make decisions with respect to the management, the oversight of the of the plans themselves. So it's a, it's a higher standard by which uh, you're not just an every average employee. You now are part of the the commission and. As, as such, you have uh, certainly some in, uh, elevated responsibilities. Making sure you follow a prudent process, I'm sure uh, 
you like like us uh, and, and your outside advisor in the pension plan, you you uh, have a, an agenda. You talk about various uh, performance of the plan, managers that are underperforming. Do we look at other asset ca- classes, alternative asset classes, whatever that might be? But you're found a process with respect to those to those decisions. Uh, remember that pre- pleading ignorance, bad communication, or, or inexperience will not be an adequate defense. You know, this is always one that's kind of interesting, but uh, you just want to make sure that each committee member is engaged in the process. And if if you don't understand something that you know we talk about or your other advisor talks about, there is a certain responsibility to raise your hand and say, look, I, could you explain that again? Because I didn't necessarily understand it. So it's really just a responsibility that you need to understand kind of your role. And, and if you don't understand something that's said, you have an obligation to ask the questions. This stuff works everywhere else, though. What's that? That last thing works everywhere else, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Indecision is a decision, you know. Well, the second area is duty of loyalty and impartiality. And I think everybody understands this and prescribes to this, but fiduciaries must ensure that all decisions are made based solely and exclusively on the interests of the plan participants and beneficiaries. And so we think about you know, the committee we work with on the defined contribution plans. When, when they're coming in the room, they're not saying, gosh, you know, I really think we ought to invest in a international emerging markets bond fund. We just think that's going to be the next big thing. Uh, a- absent of the volatility, absent of the education of that. And, and so really making sure that the decisions that we make are, are going to be decisions that every participant should at least understand and have an, have an, have informed choice, but, but really just making sure we don't offer uh, fund options that perhaps are just too volatile for those, for those participants perhaps to, to understand, but still giving them adequate choice. You're following the plan document, duh. I mean, this is kind of the dull moment. Uh, you have a great partner with Mission Square, uh, making sure that you're, you're up to speed, your document is up to speed in, in various legislative changes you think about the SECURE Act, the CARES Act, they, those are things that uh, we saw uh, necessitated uh, differences or changes within the plan document. Uh, you know, if you ever did, if, you know, the city, uh, if there was anything within the organization uh, that could, that would change, that, that could necessitate a change in the plan document. Uh, but, you know, the plan document, I think a, a, as a as a committee member, you know, on the defined contribution side, we do think it makes sense for com- committee members to at least have a cursory knowledge of the operation of the plan, not every single nuance. You know, I think Lisa did a really good job of just talking about kind of the high level provisions of the plan document, but that might be something that at least having a cursory, a cursory knowledge of the plan document might, might be helpful. Yeah, the third one, I'll turn this over to Fran, is duty to diversify. You know, David, David, you've had several questions on this one. And, and you know, wanting to make sure that we diversify plan investments so as to minimize risk of large losses. You know, one of the things that, that if we were to have a bias when we look at menu construction is really downside market protection, you know, uh, making sure, you know, if they think about the current market environment. You're, you're not immune to having pretty significant underperformance uh, for uh, uh, for this particular quarter, but making sure you have managers that, that might be uh, down less than others. So let's say a market was down 10%, we would prefer the manager to be down 9% or 8%. Uh, so it's you know, making sure you're, you're protecting as best you can with still having exposure to the, to the equity markets. For, for defined contribution plans, a plan should be diver- sufficiently diversified to afford participants to, to the opportunity to manage risk. So again, making sure we have some low risk funds, some higher risk funds, and they have choice in between. Again, we spent some time in looking and, and reaffirming the T-Row price target date funds as the that kind of default. We have a lot of participation in those target date funds when Antoinette meets with participants you know, that seemed to be a very popular vehicle, if they, especially if they want to set it and forget it. It's a well-diversified portfolio without having to select a 
select five or six different fund options and various asset classes by which to fulfill your allocation. Each plan option should be considered as part of the whole plan portfolio. This is important when we look at style purity. We wanna make sure each particular fund option works in tandem with each other. So we hire a large cap growth manager and then all of a sudden, you know, 40% of the portfolio is international. That's not necessarily a good thing. So we wanna make sure that, that the asset class by which we're invested is, is pure with respect to the underlying manager of that particular uh, asset class. And then the last item is prudence must be evaluated at the time of in investment without the benefit of hindsight. So if you were in a risk plan, let's say we made the decision to replace a fund manager and you know six months down the road, we replace that fund manager, all of a sudden that fund manager decides to leave. And it was kind of a star approach where that manager made all the decisions. You know, we, we did not have, have the benefit of hindsight at the time and so even if you were in a risk of plan you you don't you're protected in the process that we went through at the time we made the decision the information we had to make the decision so you would be protected in that vein so i said a lot uh before i turn it over to fran is anything uh anything uh i've i've said maybe caught the attention or uh, we do think it's mostly common sense but before i we turn it uh, to Fran for options four through six. Is there any questions for me? You said something interesting um, about, you know, if, if the market is down 10%, you would prefer to see less than that. Yes. So is it fair to say that downside protection versus upside opportunity is more of a focus? Yeah, yeah, I would say if there's a there's a bias, it would be more down market capture as opposed to up market. It's easier to it's easier to uh, to gain on on the upside. It's in the, um, it, it's it's much more difficult to uh, recapture lost in a down market than it is on an up market. And so our our premise is let's have managers at least do some protection. Well, well. I mean, I wouldn't say that's why I said, you know, 9% to 10. Now, I, I would not expect a manager to be like if the market's down 10 to be down one or to be flat. And, and so that just means that creates more volatility within the fund option itself. But yeah, it's, it's easier to gain, gain lot, easier to uh, recapture gains on an up market than it is on a down market. Fran? Thank you, Barry. Oh, one question, yep. please. Uh, I really appreciated the presentation. Is there benchmarking or some sort of comparison that groups like yourself, or companies like yourself do to your peers in terms of um, not so much performance, um, but just in terms of, I don't know, is there some sort of um, fiduciary um, or advisory um, comparison that you're able to uh, essentially hold yourself accountable to or compare yourself to, or is, is this doesn't really fit that kind of model? Well, you know, every advisory firm is going to have differences in approach. They're going to always, you know, they're going to have differences in uh, action in terms of how they evaluate a fund. You know, what are the certain parameters that they might look at in terms of creating some sort of action or the, you know, this fund is, is failing for four quarters. And so as a result of that, we need to replace that fund. So I don't know that there's any benchmarks uh, with that in mind. You know, the, the thing I, I, I would say is when we, when we look at funds, you know, how often are we having to replace a fund? You know, our, our methodology is simply a guide in the decision-making process. I mean, it's just really, and, and we saw that chart before that highlighted Goldman Sachs and the T. Rowe Price Midcap Growth Fund as an example. You know, that's really just a guide for the committee to say, look, we have two funds that have under, underperformed as of late. What are some of the reasons why? And we have a discussion and the committee could say, you know what, we're very uncomfortable with the direction of that particular fund. And so CAPTRA, we'd, we'd like to at least entertain some options at the next committee meeting, perhaps for a possible replacement. So it's really about the sustainability of the funds that you have, making sure that we're not replacing funds in any, in any increased frequency, 
And I think that's going to be, you know, that's going to be client driven as opposed to like industry driven. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. The uh, fourth duty is duty to monitor and supervise. We cap trust evaluate managers on a daily basis, but we prepare a quarterly report and send it out to our clients. And Barry gave you a high level overview of our scoring methodology, but what's involved in that is how did the manager perform against the appropriate benchmark? How did that manager perform relative to the appropriate peer group? And then Barry also mentioned about the manager style. So if we're hiring a um, mid-cap growth manager, we want him to stick to that particular style. Evaluate services, when we say monitor and supervise, supervise, evaluate services provided to determine if fiduciary investment advice is following the impartial conduct and best interest standards, meaning that we're doing everything in the best interest of plan participants as well as their beneficiaries. And then we evaluate service providers every few years. So you, and that's something that you should do as a committee member. Um, Barry already mentioned that we benchmark, you know, the fees for ICMA, I'm sorry, Mission Square, sorry, Steve, Mission Square. Um, but, and we report that to you all on every 12 to 18 months, just to make sure the fees that are being charged are in, are in line. But you all should be evaluating cap trust, um, whether it's every uh, few years or every five years, just to make sure that we're performing the duties that you all hired us to do. One of the great things about cap trust, and I'm saying that because I, I came from the outside, is that we have an evergreen contract for our clients. So if uh, one of our clients decided that, you know what, we want to get rid of cap trust, all they have to do is give us 30 days notice and they can void the contract. So we have that evergreen policy, but we have a 98% retention rate when it comes to our clients. So uh, our clients do believe in what we're doing for them because we're always doing things in the best interest of our clients. Duty to monitor and supervise. Uh, there is an investment policy statement. We cap trust um, what we did was a draft and investment policy statement for the city of Charlottesville. And what that did is it does, it just provides a working framework for the committee members and cap trust when we're making investment decisions. So it sets asset classes and guidelines for all the investment decisions that we make. Cap trust also included our investment policy monitoring methodology. So again, Barry talked about the scoring methodology, but uh, that's a, an appendix to the IPS that gives you an overview of how we score all the different funds. And then the IPS just establishes measurable criteria. Criteria. What we try to do is the IPS is kind of broadly written because we don't wanna be so prescriptive on, hey, like Barry mentioned, um, if a fund were to fail and, or fail our uh, investment policy monitoring methodology for three quarters, we're not saying that, hey, we've got to get rid of this fund. So we just want to make sure that we have some guidelines on how we evaluate in funds, making sure that we bring that information to the committee. And the committee always has the final say, so they can say, hey, they accept our, if we make a recommendation to move, they can say, we can accept your recommendation, we reject your recommendation, or we as a committee member can modify cap trust recommendation. Duty to monitor and supervise, document all parties who are fiduciaries. Uh, there's a committee charter. Fiduciary is responsible for the actions of one another. So as Barry said, you, you can't um, plead ignorance. So, you know, if someone doesn't know something, they need to speak up. The fiduciary liability insurance, because you all are not ERISA, doesn't apply to you all. Duty to ensure reasonable plan costs. Again, analyze and, and document the total plan costs. We cap trust do that for you all every 18 months, eight, every 12 to 18 months. I know it says two to three years, but we report that every 12 to 18 months to you all. We document when the um, fees were lowered so that we know, all right, this is the fee for, and I think we, we just lowered the fee. It was like October 1st of 2021. Um, but in a couple of years, we'll benchmark that fee just to make sure it's still in line. And the other thing is the fiduciary, you're required to know how much you're paying. Um, you're not required to have the least expensive plan, but again, we will give you a range and say whether or not 
uh, Mission Square's fee is within the range. If it's a higher on the higher end of the range or on the lower end of the range, that's what we'll report to you all. The last um, duty is the duty of avoid prohibited transactions. Uh, again, we are saying a fiduciary has a responsibility to act in the sole interest of plan participants and should avoid any decision or transaction that directly or indirectly um, that directly or indirectly benefits the plan sponsor. That means you, the city of Charlottesville. I know Steve shared the numbers between the 457B plan and the 401A. It's close to 60 million between the two plans. So as a committee member or as a city of Charlottesville, it's not like you can go out and say, hey, I'm going to go to Wells Fargo. You know, I sit on the committee and we manage about 60 million in assets. So can you give me a great deal on a mortgage? So you can never, that's a, that would be considered a prohibited transaction or selecting plan, plans, products or services on a, a preferential basis with a related party and in interest. So let's say, um, and we had this example, let's say somebody from Goldman Sachs found out that you were a committee member and said, hey, if there's any way that you can get one of our funds on, your, on the city of Charlottesville investment menu, um, I can quid pro quo, uh, give you a, a, a cutback or something like that. Anytime, and we do have, you know, these outside portfolio managers reaching out to clients. Anytime that happens, we direct our clients to have them call Cap Trust because we can handle that for you. No self-dealing. So use as a, your capacity as a plan fiduciary. You cannot deal with the plan's assets for your own benefit. And just to tr uh, try to avoid co uh, conflicts of interest. And a lot of times we might not, we as committee members or we cap trust might not know about a conflict of interest. Uh, an interesting, um, something happened at one of our, we had a committee member uh, that shared with us. We, um, as Barry was showing you the, we talked about the fund that was, um, that we had marked for review. One of our clients, we had a fund that we were recommending that they, as a committee, moved off of a particular fund. And it just so happens that one of the committee members, he said, oh, when we vote to whether or not to get rid of this fund, I might as well tell you all that portfolio manager used to work for me. So I'm going to recuse myself from when you all make the decision to remove that fund because you know we take meeting minutes, so we did, he wanted to make sure that you know because this guy, this portfolio manager, used to work for him, that when the committee decided to move off of the fund, he had nothing to do with that. So he shared that with us. He recused himself, and then when the committee said, "Okay, we're coming off of this fund," then we made a recommendation for the replacement fund. Then he jumped back in to like, "Okay, now I can vote on." The replacement fund. So again, that was some not something we would have known, but he shared it with us. And that was something that we documented in the meeting minutes that he had recused himself from the removing of that particular fund manager. Anti-kickback rule, as a plan fiduciary, you cannot get payment or benefit from anyone in connection with a plan transaction. Again, we're talking about 60 million in assets. So uh, that's something that you just wanna make sure that you as an individual or, or as a committee member um, don't benefit from that. And here are just DOL tips for employers, identify all plan fiduciaries, provide sufficient information to participants, so that they can have the right to exercise control over their retirement investments. Be aware when participant des deposits are scheduled. Um, just make sure you confirm, with this, confirm that the schedule meets the DOL requirements. And here are a few others. Document the process you use to hire a provider. Uh, be prepared to monitor the groups you hire, whether that's Mission Square, that's also Cap Trust. Review your plan documents regularly. Barry already mentioned that Mission Square is a great partner. As um, any anytime you have retirement legislation, Mission Square is going to go ahead and update your plan document for you, as well as the amendments. And then additional recommendations: review all your plan contracts, document all plan decisions regularly. When we, as a committee, meet Cap Trust, we take the meeting minutes and we do document all of the decisions that are made. And I'll stop sharing. Are there any questions on the roles of the fiduciaries? I saw at least once, maybe twice, the notion of bonding. That's it. Is that's, that, 
don't that's under it. ERISA. So yes, we'll yes, skip so that. NA. Uh, yeah, we skip that because it doesn't apply to you all. Yep. Ryan, the, the, there is an insurance policy, a uh, liability policy, policy in place by the city for the fiduciaries of, of the retirement community. And oh, good. Um, yeah, that's, that's helpful. Jason, yes. Jason could give you more information about that. Yeah, a couple okay. of years ago, uh, I mean, it's certainly not required, but the city does have a fiduciary liability insurance policy that covers all the actions of the committee, you know, list by name, you know, the members that are on the committee and uh, who our service providers are and that sort of thing. So just an extra layer of security that if we're doing the things that we're supposed to, we're, we're covered under that insurance policy if any action was ever brought against the city. That's good. Was there anything that surprised you? I mean, I, you live this and breathe this every day. So I, I, I feel comfortable like this is pretty much common sense uh, in terms of how you operate the plans, but I don't know what you all thought. Oh, it was very helpful. I thought it was helpful. I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised at the level of uh, fiduciary responsibility there seems to be for a defined uh, contribution plan, which yeah. always kind of seemed out, out of our hands for the most part. It looks like it's not entirely the case. So yeah, yeah education to do. especially when you think about it's employee, employee directed. And so, you know, we're, you know, unlike the pension plan, like, okay, based on your career, based on the formula, you get X. And so even if you make as a commission, which I'm sure you never do, make bad choices in terms of the, the asset allocation or the fund menu, it doesn't really uh, it curtail the participant from getting whatever that benefit formula is. Whereas the balance in the defined contribution plan is their balance. And so uh, to the extent we make bad choices in terms of fund menu, fund menu design, that has a direct impact on what they take home eventually. All right, thank you. That's a good point. I think when you think about the defined benefit plan, uh, we're running the whole plan and it's very obvious that we're responsible for those decisions. But then on the defined contribution plan, it could be easy to think, well, the employees are making their investment decisions. Why do we, why are we responsible for that? We're not necessarily, but there are all these other responsibilities that we do have that we need to be aware of. So yeah, it's a good point. So Jason, um, I mean, until last meeting, I didn't know this thing existed. Um, I don't know if that, that allows me to plead ignorance, um, but it, do we, I mean, is our role now somehow different? I think um, that was my, my thought on, on where we would kind of go next with this. Um, so the fiduciary training that we just, went over that standard training. If you're here long enough, you'll see that again. Um, but the rest of the presentation, I think the goal was to get everyone on the same page and one, reassure you that all of these things are happening. They were just happening at a staff level between, uh, I mean, actually the people on this call, Sarah and Lisa and myself and Chrissy. Um, and Chrissy used to be on the retirement commission uh, Lisa and Sarah provide staff report to the commission. So the oversight was occurring. Um, and I think what we're trying to do is just, you know, as Allison pointed out at the last meeting, it really should be, you know, officially under the retirement commission that you know, the commission is responsible for the retirement plans for the city. And that includes the defined benefit plan and the defined contribution plan. And so our goal over the last two meetings and probably you know, going into the next meeting is figuring out how do we integrate the, the oversight and management of the defined contribution plan into the monthly activities of the retirement commission? And, and what exactly does that look like? How involved do individual members wanna be as far as um, you know, meeting with cap trust on a quarterly basis? Or is that something that you know, you're comfortable with at the staff level and maybe we report back to you, you know, once or twice a year on what's been going on. So I think that's where we're headed is that, you know, we brought the issue up that this oversight really should fall to the retirement commission and how do we do that going forward? So 
I think, you know, in March, um, when we meet again, that, that that would be the primary topic of, okay, now we, now everyone knows about this and we're on the same page, but what does it look like now? So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, sort of. So Jason, at the meeting in March, will you all be presenting some options in terms of what oversight might look like? I think that sounds like a good idea. I mean, like, like University of Virginia, for example, uh, we, we on, a, on a yearly basis, one for the Board of Visitors, we report uh, the happenings of the retirement plan once a year to that board. And they, uh, before that, we, they have, I think, two members of the Finance Committee of the Board of Visitors uh, are engaged in a conversation with us. We go through the year in review, and then they ultimately present it to the Board of Visitors. So, yeah, I mean, I... Yeah, I'm thinking through like if the committee wants to meet with us quarterly, we're certainly willing and able to do that. Maybe it's it's more like we do that periodically, whatever that might be. But I'll, I'll leave that in your hands. And Over again, Cap, Cap Trust provides uh, advice for both defined contribution and defined benefit. Correct, our total portfolio. Well, we, if we were if we were so honored to serve the need to the defined benefit plan, yes, we do have that capability. Oh, but that's not what happens now. No, we are uh, we are we do, are not the advisor to the defined benefit plan. I'm sorry. Okay. No, that's yeah. oh, it's, a, it's just an open wound. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jason, do is that. Yeah, they have associates. Um, has been the financial advisor on the pension for side a long time. for a long time. Yeah. Who? who? Uh, Dayhab Associates. We went through a process, um, Brian, um, I don't know, what was it, a year and a half, two years ago, um, of evaluating Dayhab and three or four other alternatives. Um, it was pretty interesting. It was, it was no small deal. Um, and in the end of the day, ended up um, deciding to stay with DAHAB. And that's a requirement that uh, those contracts, uh, Jason, how long can they live? Great. Contract is, is five years. Well, it's, it was, I don't know the initial term, it's renewed annually, but I think the uh, the scope was five years at that point. And was the last RFP issued as a best practice or was it a, re a timeout requirement? Um, I think it was a little bit of both. It was, you know, best practice to issue the RFP, but uh, I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, we went through a process where we looked at whether that was the best model for us. And we looked at um, OCIO, which would be an outsourcing of the investment management process or whether the commission wanted to retain those responsibilities and have oversight over the individual managers. And we spent several months going through that process and decided to stick with um, what we had using a, a consultant, but managing the defined benefit plan and under that model. And so at that point, we put it out to bid again, just to, to make sure that we were you know, doing our due diligence on, on that side, so. And Jason is um, Mission Square, the record keeper for the defined benefit plans. So we don't really have a record keeper on that side because there aren't individual accounts like there are for the defined contribution plan. Um, we do have a custodian, which is Truist Bank, uh, and they uh, hold all of the assets that the investment managers are, are trading, basically. So there's a, a similar arrangement, but it's not the same um, because there aren't individual accounts. Yeah. And Brian, we do have an actuarial for the defined, defined benefit plan as well. Any other questions while we still have Cap Trust with us? Barry, I thought that was a really good presentation. Um, Thank you. Normally, frequently, not normally, you know, there's a lot of 
things that are not easily approachable and you managed to make it really approachable um, with a lot of information. So I appreciate that. No, thank you very much. And yeah, we do this on UVA as well. So it's the same, same concept and, and they aren't ERISA either, but we do think it's applicable the, the applicable to, to your position, so. Well, great. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Lisa, is the only other thing, well, I guess, is there any other business before we go into closed session? Okay, um, so just procedurally what we're gonna do, um, we need to have a short closed session uh, to talk about, uh, to, just to give an update from the investment subcommittee. And Lisa sent out, was it yesterday, the link for the closed session. So if you remember the last few times we've done a closed session, it was on the phone conference line, which is not the greatest. Um, so we're gonna try using uh, Zoom to do the closed session instead. So. What you want to do is leave this Zoom meeting and the communications department will leave the meeting open for us and then use the secondary link that Lisa sent out to join the closed session Zoom meeting. But uh, before we do motion. that, yeah, we have to take a motion to go into closed session. Um, did somebody have that already or do you want me to pull it up? I got ben, it. Yeah. Okay. You said we'll leave this one live also as we go. No, together. close this. You have close. to close this. Yeah, we have to read in the closed session first, though. So, uh, this is a motion for closed session of the Charlottesville Retirement Commission, pursuant to Section two point two dash three seven one two of the Virginia Code. I hereby move that the Charlottesville Retirement Commission, as the duly appointed local retirement system for the city, close this open meeting and convene in a closed session for one discussions by the Commission of Information subject to exclusion. 2.2-3705.7, specifically discussions concerning information held by the retirement system relating to internal deliberations or decisions by the retirement system of particular investment strategies or the selection or termination of investment managers prior to the execution of such investment strategies or the selection or termination of such managers where disclosure of such information would have an adverse impact on the financial interest of this retirement system and trade secrets provided by a private entity to the retirement system would have an adverse impact on the financial interest of the retirement system. This closed session is authorized by Virginia Code 2.2-3711A38. Do I have a second? I can second that. All in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Anyone opposed? All right. See you on the other side.
Hello, everyone. Hey, okay, we're back. We're See, back, and, we're gonna, and we're going to finish by 1030. All right, Ben, do you want to read schedule? The... <laughs> this is a certification of a closed meeting by the Charlottesville Retirement Commission. I move that this commission certify by a recorded vote that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and identified in the motion convening closed session were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed session. Do I have a second? Second. Excellent. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Very good. Jason, take it away. Okay. Um, Chris, would you be willing to make a motion in regards to? Uh, I'll give a shot here. Somebody can, can jump in and uh, offer an amendment if I, if I don't get it quite right. So uh, I move that we um, begin procedures to terminate all spring as one of our managers and direct day having associates to begin uh, a competitive search uh, for a replacement uh, investment firm. Probably the reverse order of what you just said. Thanks, David. Yeah. So the motion is to do a competitive search. Competitive search. I second Chris's motion to do a competitive search to replace Allspring. Potentially, if we so choose. <laughs> All right, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed to the motion? Okay, great. Thank you all very much. Um, if there's no other business, I guess we'll adjourn the meeting. I think someone has right. to make a motion to oh, right? Lisa. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I I move that we adjourn this two hour meeting. I second. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Sorry Aye. it was so long today. Thanks, Lisa. Goodbye. <laughs>